Welcome back. This is another video of our MLOP Zoom Camp, and in this video, we will take a closer look at the notebook we created previously in the previous video and see which things could be improved in this notebook. And first, when I start this notebook, when I start looking at this notebook, so I see some code and it's actually, remember, we already cleaned some code. So previously it was just a bunch of cells that we needed to execute one after another. I don't remember if we needed to execute them in a particular order or just uh, one after another, but still like we needed to execute them multiple times. Here they are already in one place. So it's already good. And then we train dictionary vectorizer and the model and we look at the results. And now I'm recording this video a couple of days after the previous one. And now I look at this and think, okay, do we actually need these cells? Because here I see that there is a function. So we took the code, you know, this code in this cell and put it in a function. And then we got our data frame train, data frame validation. So I'm not sure if we actually need this. Probably we don't. So I'll just go ahead and delete it. But it's not clear, right, if it's needed or not. So this is one of the issues with notebooks because notebooks are usually intended for experiments. And uh, because of that, I often allow myself to be sloppy with notebooks, which often results in a mess. And later it's not clear which things are still needed in which order I need to execute these cells. And here, um, I think here the order is fine. We actually, so what we do is we use this function. So we already did this first step and we created this function. We put all the code in the function, which we can easily use. This is a good thing, but it's, we can make it even more modular. For example, by taking it out of a notebook and putting this to a Python script. And let's say if we need to execute this for a different data set for February or for March, here we need to just go here and manually change this. Right, and then re-execute the notebook. Before talking about that, I want to talk a bit about this part here and this part here where we train the model. And as you remember, for this part, I actually trained a lot of different models. So first it was rich, rich regression, which I trained with different parameters. I don't know, was it 0 0.001, then 0 0.001, then 0 0.01, then 1. But now in this notebook, all I remember, all I know is the performance of this model of lasso model with this particular parameter. So I lost all the history. I don't remember how good rich regression was. Was it better than lasso? Was it worse? The only thing I remember that it was worse than linear regression, which I guess the only thing that matters right now. But oftentimes we want to go back and see what was the performance. And all of this was lost because the way we work in notebooks, the way we do experiments is I just change a value and I re-execute this and then I see what happens. And in my mind, when I work on this notebook, I remember, aha, this is better. Let's use this one. In principle, I can also, for example, what I often do, I keep track of models I trained. So for example, I can write lasso zero one, this value I can use my notebook and tracker this. This is a good first step to remembering what happened. Then another thing, maybe more advanced, could be using Google spreadsheet or Excel files for tracking that. It's also prone to error. And a better approach would be instead of just executing this and then relying on memory or on Google spreadsheets, lock all these metrics to a special place called experiment tracker. And we can always go back to this experiment tracker and see how well this model did compared to Rich, compared to Lasso, compared maybe to other models. So we preserve the history. Another issue with this notebook is here. So we saved this thing. I think it was this linear regression, right? And uh, the dictionary vectorizer here. So we saved this, but also as you see, we have LR here. Right. And when experimenting, I could have executed this cell as well. And then it would overwrite the variable, this LR, and then my model could be lost. When I save the model, I'm not sure if I saved the latest version, what was the performance for this model. It's all not clear. Because if we look at the name of the file, all we know here that it's a linear regression, but also lasso is kind of a linear regression as well. What was the performance for this model? Was it better? How better was it? It's not clear. So another thing we can do is to save this model to a place called model registry. And then model registry would keep all these models with the metric, like they usually go together with experiment tracker. So all these metrics, all these models, 
could be saved in one place and later when I go there I can just see okay this was that particular model and that particular model had this particular performance right and then there is no ambiguity so that's one part when it comes to training a model and we will actually cover that in module 2 about experiment tracking so we will use a tool called mlflow for that we will see how to track experiments with mlflow and we will see how to save and load models with mlflow and we will talk a bit about the model registry component of mlflow here we will use these external tools to help us with experimenting, to help us with reproducibility and with tracking everything that we do. Because a notebook, as you see, it's so easy to overwrite the results and then the history is lost. Yeah, we need tools to help us remember things. So that's one part. But then let us come back to this cell. It's already good that we took all the cells and put them in a function, but there is still much more we can do here. For example, as I said, what if we want to experiment with other dates? We need to go to this notebook, change this, re-execute this in a particular order, remembering what was executed already, what should not be executed. Sometimes it happens that there is a cell that we execute only once, we don't want to execute it every time. So for example, like uh, here, this uh, dictionary vectorizer, right? We don't execute it every time. When we do parameter tuning, we only change this part because we already have our feature matrix. We know that when we experiment with something, we do not need to execute this unless, of course, we add more features. And while working on notebook, it's kind of clear. But later, if you need to change something, then it becomes problematic. Like because by the time you do this, you probably forgot which things need to be executed, which not. And to solve these problems, we have another set of best practices and tools that can help us with decomposing our notebook and turning this into something that can be easily re-executed. This is called machine learning pipelines. So we will talk about multiple tools and best practices for doing this. And we will take this notebook that we have here and break it down into multiple steps. So for example, the first step here that we have is load and prepare data then the second step that we have is uh, training the dictionary vectorizer and turning the data frame into a feature matrix and then once we do that the next step is training a model and then there could be different models of course they form some sort of workflow we know that in order to train a model, we first need to vectorize the data frame. And to vectorize the data frame, we actually need to prepare the data frame. And when we train a model, try different parameters, we actually don't need to execute this part over and over again unless we change something in the vectorizer. So we can organize our code into so-called ML pipeline. And of course, there could be a lot more steps and uh, we can parameterize these pipelines. So for example, could be like uh, train data is January 2021 and validation data. Even though here we do not have steps for validation, but of course we can add more steps here. And then for validation, we would use February 2021 and things like this or what kind of model we want to execute. I don't know, linear regression, things like this. So then once these things are in a pipeline, we can easily re-execute re them with just, I don't know, a, a simple script like Python pipeline.py. And then we can parameterize it saying that train data is this, then uh, validation data is this and so on. Right? And then it's very easy to reproduce. And we, if we need to retrain something, then yeah, we just execute this. We will talk about tools for doing that. We will talk about Prefect and Kubeflow pipelines in module three, and we will see how to turn our notebook in a proper machine learning pipeline that we can easily re-execute. We don't stop there, of course. The output of the pipeline is a model. Also, we have this uh, dictionary vectorizer here. So, and we have this model here, and we need to take this model, and so let me put it here. We need to take this model and start using this. So usually for that, we put the model in some sort of machine learning service. And in our case, clients who want to order a taxi, they use their phone to communicate with the service. And the service would say that if you want to go from this point to this point, it will take, I don't know, 20 minutes. That's one way of deploying the model. So this is um, a web service. But there are other ways of deploying the model, and we will talk about that in the serving model. So we will discuss what are different options and how we can actually 
take this SQL file and start serving this model to our users. But again, this is not the end of the story. Once the model is deployed, once users started using this, we need to make sure that the model is still performing well. And for that, we need to add monitoring. We need to see that the model is doing fine. And when it's not doing fine, when we see that there is drop in performance, then our monitoring system would send an alert and somebody from our team, could be machine learning engineers, they will get an alert to their phone. So this is their phone, and this is the alert. So they will go there, they will see what is happening, and they will try to fix this. Sometimes it's even possible to take it one step further and exclude humans from the equation at all. When something like this happens, when we see that there is a performance drop, what can happen is we can just go back to our pipeline and re-execute it with the new data. So this pipeline would produce a new model and we can just deploy this new model automatically. And this is the highest automation level that is possible for machine learning services when humans are not involved at all. Of course, we need to have a lot of trust in our system, but this is something we can look forward to and see how we can design our system in such a way that it is possible to take the model that we have and automatically retrain it with the pipeline and automatically deploy it with our deployment and then start monitoring it again. And that's actually all I wanted to talk about in this video. So we talked about all the problems in this notebook and we saw how we can use best practices and tools from MLOps to solve this. And uh, maybe I can say a few words about the last two models. They are not necessarily related to notebook, but they are related to pretty much everything. So the six models is best practices. So here we have this training pipeline. And the idea here is to automate everything, automate training and exclude human from the training process. And this is one of the DevOps practices. Each of these steps here is a piece of code and this code needs to be maintainable, it needs to be tested, it needs to be clean, it needs to be well documented, and we will talk about things like that in our Model 6, like how we actually package this pipeline in Docker, or also how do we package our web service in Docker, how do we deploy it, what kind of practices we should use for that, how we can keep our code in a good condition and pleasant to work with. And then finally, Model 7, we'll talk about processes. So uh, usually data scientists do not work in isolation. Machine learning engineers do not work in isolation. And MLOps is not just about tools that we use for doing all that that I described. It's also about processes. It's also about how people work together in such a way that all these things that we talked about do not fall apart. Everyone owns the code, everyone wants the projects. And most importantly, we know what we are doing and we know that we are solving the right problem and uh, we know how to approach this problem. This is what this module will focus on and we will focus on developing better understanding of the problem that we want to solve. So that's all from this video. In this video, we looked at this notebook and mapped all the pieces of this notebook that could be improved to different modules of our course. And here at the end of the video, I also talked a bit about automatic retraining and excluding humans from the process completely. This is possible with MLOps, but it requires a system to be in a very mature state. Only then we can do something like this. We have to have a lot of trust in our system to do that because we need to know that our system does not fall apart when a model is automatically retrained and gets deployed. There are different maturity levels that our project can have from level zero when there is no MLOps at all to level four when everything is automated. And in the next video, I want to spend some time talking about this maturity model and see what kind of maturity levels are there. I also want to spend some time discussing if we sh should always go to the highest possible maturity level or not. So see you soon.